Hello and welcome back for another lecture, this one on the solar budget. So in this video I'll be discussing not just the solar budget, but just you know, kind of taking it you know, back a step. We'll introduce solar energy. We'll introduce the radiation that is emitted from the sun and how it comes to the earth within the electromagnetic spectrum. We'll talk about once the energy is received, how is it budgeted across our planet in the form of absorption, reflection, uh, as well as in scattering. We'll also talk a little bit about, because it's an important part of this budget, is the long-term effect, right? Looking at global warming and what type of gases are within our atmosphere that either work with or against that energy that's coming in. We'll introduce short wave versus long wave and a couple other different attributes and aspects of just the Earth-Sun relationship. So, that being said, let's get going. All right, so back to the beginning. What is solar energy? Well, energy from the sun that reaches the earth arrives as solar radiation, which is part of a larger collection of energy known as the electromagnetic spectrum. Now, solar radiation includes visible light, ultraviolet light, infrared, uh, radio waves, X waves, gamma rays. Now, what is radiation? When we use that term, radiation is one way to transfer heat as to radiate, meaning to go out from a central location. This is true with saying things such as light and sound. So I, there's this little animation I'll hit play on right here. So you can see that you know, the sun is, is radiating energy outward and we know that energy is being observed and, you know, and taken in by the earth itself. We also acknowledge that that radiation from the sun is going in all different directions, uh, but we're only really focusing at this point what reaches the earth and that amount that we consider that reaches the earth is our 100% of that budget. So we're only interested in what actually reaches the earth itself. Uh, so what I've provided down below is a very simplified electromagnetic spectrum scale uh, showing the different types of names that are given to the different types of frequencies. And the main thing that I wanted to point out within this is what we consider wavelength. So we have both short wave and long wave. And really a great way to, uh, as you can tell I was not prepared, but I guess had this fantastic idea. A great way to think about that is by using one of the greatest inventions of all time, the slinky. So when we have long wave, how long those waves are up, down, up, down. But when I move it really close, look at how fast it goes up and down, up and down. In fact, I need to almost make it smaller so it can move faster. So we have short wave versus long wave. And we'll talk a little bit more about those two types of waves because they are received and distributed very differently from one another. Um, well, I guess I can kind of talk a little bit about it if you think about it, you know, in that sense that the majority of the energy that we're receiving from the sun is considered short wave. And that's, you know, generally, generally is visible light is what we're most concerned with. So when, you know, the sun is shining and you're outside and you're sticking your hand up towards the light, <clears throat> your skin, your hand is absorbing that radiation, that visible light, that short wave. But what ends up happening is that your hand is able to absorb some of that short wave. And in doing so, uh, it changes the wavelength and makes it long wave, which radiates outward, which ends up long wave turns into sensible heat. So you're not actually receiving the sunlight burning your hand. The sun is, your hand is absorbing the sunlight and turning it into heat, which is what's burning your hand, which is kind of a cool thing to think about. So moving forward, uh, solar energy and the atmospheric effects. Well, this is a very important thing. So here we have again that electromagnetic spectrum, you know, with you know, a very limiting amount, but it's kind of, you know, there in vision. Um, but what I wanted to introduce was this blue line, which is our atmosphere. Uh, and why is that important? Well, because you'll notice right off the bat, because we're observing this image, that a lot of the radiation is coming down and I think it's, it stops, right? A lot of the ultraviolet stops, a lot of the X-ray, a lot of the gamma rays, which are incredibly dangerous, those things stop in our atmospheres. And that's really important because it's protecting us and our planet from some of this really, really aggressive radiation. So it says ozone serves to absorb harmful ultraviolet radiation in the ozone layer, which is part of the Earth's stratosphere. Well, what if there was no ozone layer? Well, if you didn't have that protectant layer, that radiation would be able to infiltrate and then reach the surface. I know it's a terrible example, but I often think and compare the ozone layer very similar to that of sunblock. 
perhaps you've been to the beach at some point and you've laved, you know, lathered yourself up in sunblock and you just happen to miss that one spot, you know, wherever it might be, and that's the only spot that burns. That sunblock was able to block out a lot of that radiation and to prevent you from getting burnt. But that one spot that you missed, it's what's going to burn. Well, that one spot is very similar to the effect that occurred when we had these massive holes in the ozone layer. So when, we, when, we, when you hear about the, uh, the holes in the ozone layer, that's essentially what it is. That there was a spot of sunblock that was missed, mostly because we destroyed that part of the ozone, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit, allowing that radiation to then come through and burn, right, yourself. Uh, so what if there was no ozone layer? It would be very, it'd be, no, well, it's, the ozone layer is detrimental to the survival of multi-celled and single-cell organisms. So there's really no negotiating on that. Now, carbon dioxide is also able to absorb radiation, which traps heat within our atmosphere. The more and more carbon dioxide, the more and more heat will be trapped. Um, also, solar radiation will include visible light, ultraviolet light, infrared radio. We mentioned that kind of before. But, you know, this kind of bring it back into perspective is that, you know, we have these varying effects of radiation that are coming in, uh, some of which, as we'll learn in a moment, are, some, are able to bounce right back out into space and are lost completely, but some will infiltrate and come through the atmosphere and reach the Earth's surface, in which we'll begin to do a couple different things. But, you know, again, when I kind of mentioned before visible light versus um, sensible heat, you know, are, a lot of these uh, you know, when speaking specifically about like you know infrared, visible light, and ultraviolet light, you know when it does find a way to get in, it can actually get trapped within the Earth, and that's kind of important. Into a, a you know when we hear about the greenhouse effect, we often think that's like a really bad negative you know, connotation, but it's really not. The greenhouse effect is important because without it, we would be freezing to death. So we do need a balance of warmth, right? You know, I think of the, and I'll talk, I guess, you know, I can't get so excited, I just kind of move too far fast, but uh, when speaking like the greenhouse effect, I think of it like, you know, layers of our atmosphere in a sense, like blankets. So we have all these additional gases that are within our atmosphere, like blankets, are going to then trap in your heat. And, you know, sure, one or two is perfect on a cold night, but if you had like four or five or six blankets, you'd be like, wow, it's trapping way too much heat and it's getting really uncomfortable. Um, and that's what we're seeing is that as some of these greenhouse gases are, you know, at exorbitant rates of which we have not seen in the last you know, over a thousand years, uh, we're finding that it's trapping more and more of this heat, which is progressively causing a, you know, a global warming, right? Which is another concept that we'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, anyway, moving forward, solar energy, atmospheric effects. So, since we've now acknowledged that energy does come from the sun, does come to the earth, um, we do measure it and we call it the solar constant. The solar constant is the average rate at which solar energy is received by the earth. And this is about two calories of heat or one Langley of energy per square centimeter per minute. So we're looking at this as a measurement of on average how much energy is coming through. Now, the reason that the solar constant is an average as you may well know now, uh, as you progress through some of these videos and just through just you know thought processes, um, is that seasons change, length of daylight changes, areas in which solar radiation is going to be absorbed versus released. There's a lot of variables that are in place. So we want to get a really good measurement of the average. Another thing that's important to note is that we do measure this average outside our atmosphere. Any guess why? Why would it be more important to try to get an average outside the atmosphere versus maybe on the Earth's surface? Okay, I gave you long enough to think. Hopefully you came up with clouds or some form of diversion that will block that radiation on the Earth that's not often common, right? That's a variable. And so we try to measure the solar constant outside the atmosphere because we, we don't want any interactions with anything else. We want to know the raw number of what the average is because even though some of that energy may not reach the earth because maybe a cloud stops it, that cloud does have the ability to absorb some of it which could then still turn into a grander scheme of that distribution. So kind of a fun thing to think about. Now um, calories, now if you are someone who is um, who studies nutrition, you'll, you'll probably disagree, but I think it's a great way to kind of put in perspective. So we're talking about, okay, so the solar constant is about two calories of heat, um, you know, 
per square centimeter. So what do you, what do you mean by calories? Well, calories is a measurement of heat or more of energy, right? So just kind of like when I think about um, like a cheeseburger, you know, going to you know, Carl's Jr., getting a big Carl, it's like almost a thousand calories. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means that I need, you know, in order for that burger to go away calorie wise, I need to create enough energy to burn a thousand calories. So I need the energy which is the capacity to do work, to dissolve or to remove those calories. So it is a measurement of energy and heat, which I think is kind of you know, pretty cool. So I've mentioned now the constant, I've mentioned uh, the electromagnetic spectrum. So what does that look like on a grander scheme? Because I've kind of mentioned these things of well, clouds can you know, absorb some, reflect some, there's this, there's this imbalance of, of energy. Well, that's where we introduce shortwave and longwave radiation. So shortwave radiation, uh, which is identified on the left-hand side, um, is really that radiation coming directly from the sun uh, that is passing through the atmosphere. Generally, we talk about it just being observable uh, light, right? That's shortwave radiation coming through. Uh, long wave is what's observed on the right-hand side, which is more reflective. Uh, but it's not just reflective off the surface, it's reflective of remittance, right? So now it's moving into a longer wavelength, otherwise known as sensible heat, that we can feel that warmth. So we have this idea of short wave and long wave. So short wave, as you can see, I'm just gonna go through this very quickly, incoming radiation can come through. It can be absorbed by the atmosphere. It can be reflected by clouds back out into the greater beyond, but it can also be absorbed on the Earth's surface. When energy is absorbed, it's because it has low albedo. Albedo is a measurement of whiteness a surface may have. The whiter the surface, the more reflective the surface. The darker the surface, the more the ability of absorption is increased. So I often think about this as like a, maybe a car. You know, you have a black car versus a white car sitting out in the parking lot on a hot, hot summer day. Which car will be hotter on the inside? What will be the black car? Because the black car has been absorbing a lot more of that solar radiation throughout the course of the day. Cool. So other things to think about. How do we really, that was another way to envision the differences between these. I'm gonna go back to your car. Now I'm not interested in the color of the paint. Now I'm interested in the glass, the windows. So shortwave radiation, which is visible light, is able to shine through, through the windshield, through the side windows, and go into the car and light up the interior of your vehicle. Perfect, we all can agree to that. The interior, or maybe the upholstery of your vehicle is able to absorb some of that radiation. In doing so, it will emit, or it will radiate, a different type of energy, long wave. It'll be sensible heat. So that sensible heat is different from visible light, right? So sensible heat gets trapped in the car because that light is shining through, it's passing through the glass, it's slowing down its wavelength, it gets absorbed in the upholstery, it's now being re-emitted as sensible heat. So now you have these photons of heat that are trapped in your vehicle bouncing around. So that's why it can be really hot outside. And then you open your car and it's like, oh my gosh, it's hotter in my car than it was outside. And then you can feel the hot air go you know, outside of the window or the door when you're opening it. And that's because your vehicle has been trapping in that heat, which is exactly what happens in the greenhouse effect, right? Our atmosphere is able to trap in some of that heat. And so that's kind of that, that same effect that we're able to see. So things that are important to talk about, short wave, visible light, long wave, radiated heat, sensible heat. We've also now been able to talk a little bit about the word albedo, the level of whiteness a surface has. The whiter the surface, the higher the albedo. The lower the surface, the lower, <laughs> the, lower the darker the surface, the lower the albedo. Uh, white reflects more, darker colors do not. All right, the solar budget. So we can see that the solar budget is like any budget. We're only interested in the you know what's coming in. So we're looking at you know of the energy that's coming from the sun to the earth, we've measured as 100%. So that's all we're concerned with is what is being emitted to the earth. So of that 100%, it is distributed a couple different ways. 51% is absorbed by the earth's surface. 4% is reflected off of the Earth's surface. 20% is absorbed in clouds and the atmosphere, and another 25% is completely reflected by the atmosphere clouds, clouds back out into space. So we can see that there's, you know, a total of 25 plus 4, 29% is 
reflected back out into space. 20% is absorbed in the atmosphere and clouds, 51% on the surface. So what does this really mean? So you notice that it's broken up into two colors. We're looking at you know, short wave, visible light, long wave being sensible heat. Well, again, we come back to that word albedo. The darker the surface, the more absorption you're gonna have. The lighter the surface or the higher the albedo, the more reflective the surface. So we can see that 51% of the energy again is absorbed by the Earth's surface. What surfaces would absorb that? Rock, mountain, you know, right? Uh, dirt, uh, concrete, darker colored surfaces will be able to absorb that radiation. What surfaces will be able to uh, you know, reflect? Lighter colored surfaces. Things that are shiny, ice, snow, water. Water is able to reflect and also able to absorb but lighter colored surfaces. Maybe a good example of this would be a lot of the newer buildings today, um, even the big tall skyscrapers are painting the top of the roof white because they're trying to reflect more because if the, if the building is absorbing that solar radiation throughout the course of a day, it's bound to make the building hot. So the more we're able to reflect, essentially the cooler the building will remain. And then again, we can see that the uh, atmosphere and clouds are able to absorb 20%. Um, you know, that can be just because of the gases themselves, but it can also be because of the particulate matter that's in there, in the clouds uh, that can, you know, in a darker color, maybe it's ash or soot, that's able to absorb that radiation. And then 25% is just bouncing right back out into space. Cool. Short wave, visible light. Boom, boom, boom. We're seeing it's going all different places. Now, look at... As the energy absorbed at the surface, it will transform into long wave radiation or sensible heat. So that sensible heat is seen in a diff couple different ways. We can see that 30% of the absorbed energy will be radiated by Earth's surface and water vapor and conduction of rising air. So that light is absorbed in the surface and it will then turn into long wave, which is sensible heat, which then can heat the molecules in the air and warm air rises. It can also cause water to evaporate in which an energy transfer happens. That again, kind of feeds that fuel of lifting. We can see that 6% of that long wave radiation is uh, radiated by the surface back out towards space we want more of it to go out because the less that, um, the more that is released out of that sensible heat, um, the cooler your climate will be. And then we can see that the clouds release about 64% um, of that energy, that heat. So this is the solar budget. It's kind of complicated, but I think that the big takeaway is that, okay, either the energy is absorbed, it is, or it will be um, reflected or in some cases, it could be scattered, in which it kind of travels, you know, linear, uh, horizontally, linearly, any different way it wants to go. Light has the ability to do that. The main percentages are going to be 51% of the solar energy received by the Earth is absorbed. Um, about 30% of the energy that is received by the sun of that shortwave radiation is going to be reflected back out. And then we have another 20% that's absorbed in our atmosphere and clouds. And then we can see that, okay, and then of that, we then have long wave radiation. That wavelength slows down, turns into sensible heat, and it gets trapped within our atmosphere, uh, which is important, right? Because we want a little bit of that warmth. Otherwise, we would continue to be cold. We just want to limit that. So moving on to my next piece here is looking again, I mentioned, but albedo the level of whiteness a surface has. So this is a great diagram I found that kind of puts it on average, that we have, um, you know, the average of, you know, the Earth's average is right around, around sand, uh, which is a percentage of about 30% on average. But, you know, the whiter the surface, the more reflective it will be. Um, notice that water, I mentioned it already, is not at zero, uh, because it does reflect a little bit. Uh, so that's important to see. But I think this is a very interesting diagram. You're like, okay, I get it. So it's you know, a level of whiteness, a great, example of this. I was teaching at a different college a long time ago and someone said I need a, a science project uh, to test albedo. And I said this is great because they have a, they had a little uh, daughter that was doing a science fair project. I said you need to get an ice tray, you know, the, the plastic tray that you put water in, you freeze it, it turns into ice cubes. I said and make each ice cube a different color. Yellow, pink, red, purple. You know, put all the colors in there, make it as dark as you can. And then we have one that's just normal. I said, then you go outside onto the concrete or the asphalt uh, on a hot summer day and you put all the ice cubes out at the exact same time and see if the color of the ice cube, if there is a correlation with its melting rate. 
And she said, that seemed kind of interesting. So they did it. And then what did she find out? She found out that the darker or the more color that was in that ice cube, the faster it melted on the surface. So that's a, a very interesting uh, perspective on how to view albedo and how to view that absorption rate, which I think is pretty cool. So I've mentioned the greenhouse effect. Um, the greenhouse effect is a very important thing. Without it, or we would freeze. So we do want a balance. But as you can see by this diagram, it takes you through six steps. It says the sun's uh, radiation travels towards the Earth. About half of it is reflected or absorbed by the clouds somehow within our atmosphere. Uh, the Earth is also able to release some of that heat back out towards space. We also see that some of this heat is passed through the atmosphere, but most of it is captured. Um, and retained by greenhouse gases. So you might be asking, well, what are greenhouse gases? Well, those are variable gases that are found within our atmosphere, meaning, as we've talked about before, and if you haven't checked it out, check out my atmospheric presentation, that we have permanent and variable gases. Permanent means it's a flat number what we have, a straight number that will never fluctuate of nitrogen, oxygen, stuff like that. Variable gases, though, mean that they can variate dramatically within a very short period of time. So an example of some of uh, the greenhouse gases, carbon dioxide, methane, right? Uh, there's also, well, there's others that we can talk about with our carbonic acids and stuff like that. But um, I wanted to stick with carbon dioxide and methane uh, here. Water vapor is another one. You know, you might be thinking, well, you know, cars, 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 the more cars we have, the more CO2. It's like, well, you're right, but it's combustion. So it's, you know, it's not just human induced. It's also nature induced, right? We have these, you know, these incredible forest fires that are burning through and releasing all this stored carbon. We've got, um, volcanoes that are erupting that are not only putting out carbon dioxide in the atmosphere but they're also boiling water uh, that are put that's forcing those waters into water vapor so there's a lot of different aspects that put into this but anthropogenically we know that humans have there's been a, gr a dramatic increase of these gases since we have been in the production scene so here's a great diagram that I found uh, this is from uh, one of the climate reports, and it's just specifically, I'm most you know, concerned with CO2 and non-CO2 greenhouse gases. Notice the lines and how, you know, we have some, we should always have some, there's always has been a fluctuation. So, you know, when you talk about people who don't, you know, don't agree with climate change, they will acknowledge that we do know that there have been fluctuations of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, dramatic fluctuations. Uh, but we can see that between, you know, you know, the early 1800s to today that we have gone up by parts per million, you know, almost 250 to 300 parts per million in, in an increase, which is a dramatic increase uh, that we, a lot of this is very directly related to the manufacturing and for the combustion rates of energy that we need to fuel, you know, our world. I mentioned that you, you sometimes might come across people who say, well, yeah, but this is normal. These, these, these carbon rates, we've got the ice cores, we get this data, it goes up and down, up and down. Yes, yes, they do, they do. Um, but we also have to remember that humans weren't there. So these were, are also associated with either mass expansions or mass extinctions. So yes, climate, we know that during the Carboniferous, when the CO2 levels were really high, that, you know, it won't. We know that there was a big expansion. I mean dragonflies were like over six foot in size. Leaves on plants were massive. Things were growing at a rapid rate because there was a lot more carbon dioxide. And we know that when, like, especially vegetation, it absorbs that carbon dioxide um, and it you know, converts it into oxygen and then it's able to grow. But it was incredibly, incredibly hot and humid uh, to levels of which you, they had, Florida had nothing on that. So, you know, so those are things we can take into consideration is that, yeah, there have been fluctuating rates, but humans were not there. Other animals and species were there that if they live in the water, humidity and incredible heat isn't going to bother them too much if they were already living in the oceans or if they're built for that type of design. You know, that's okay. If not, they, they, they die out. And so those are things to kind of think about um, when talking about the greenhouse effect and looking at this, this global change on how we're able to see a measurable, substantial change within the last 100 to 150 years. Which brings me then to, again, the greenhouse effect diagram. I guess thought this was a great example to finish with. So it's showing natural greenhouse effects versus human enhanced greenhouse effects. So yes, natural 
happened. I mean, there were high CO2 values, uh, you know, several thousand years ago. Um, you know, they were starting to increase again about the 10,000 year mark and so on and so forth. We've had these incredible times in which atmospheric studies have been able to prove and provide that there have been tremendous amounts of this coming in. Great. But we note that even though we were receiving or had more, we had more release as well as sometimes. So anyway, what's important to point out the differences between these is that we do have some additional greenhouse gases that otherwise can be natural, but also have been produced uh, in uh, volumed amounts that are not. Uh, you know, again, nitrous oxide, uh, methane, uh, carbon dioxide, these are things that, you know, they exist, but there is a direct correlation with human consumption and their production. So, um, again, this wasn't a global warming presentation by any means or a climate change presentation, but it's just to kind of point out that, okay, these do play a role, that the sun's energy for us has been constant. We have a measurable amount, but we're finding that different rates of it over time have either been released back out into space or have been trapped within our atmosphere. The more energy that is trapped within our, our atmosphere, the warmer the Earth will be. Another thing to mention about that is it's not, it's not equitable, that heat. So it's not, it's not just like, okay, well, we're going to see a global warmth of 0 0.01 degrees. No, it's not. It's generally in pockets because it's not equitable because it's where it's being received. When the earth is at a tilt, so the energy and length of daylight is different across different latitudes at different times of year. So it does vary a lot depending on areas. That is why you will see places on the east coast of the United States that are getting torrential rain and hurricanes, and then we're going through a huge drought on the west coast. And it's like, we don't, wouldn't it be nice if things were just equitable and equal across the board and we all have the same like we, you know, we could take their excess rain they can take our drought and we can mix it up but it doesn't work that way because we have these earth patterns and these patterns do not necessarily allow for that to occur but anyway I digress as usual so that is an introduction and basics of the solar budget energy comes in energy goes out some get stored wavelength changes from short wave often to long wave short wave is visible light long wave is sensible heat and those are some very important tools in which we can use if we wanted to build this on top of other attributes. Maybe you want to talk more about solar voltaics. Maybe you want to talk about uh, different ways to generate electricity. These are tools that you would need as a foundation to start off with that. But I think this is an important way for us to introduce the electromagnetic spectrum of radiation, for us to see how the energy is coming in and out and where it's going and what's coming up next, and then to see what the long-term pieces of it can be, uh, and in some cases the short-term when it comes to global warming and those greenhouse gases within the greenhouse effect. I hope this was helpful. Don't forget to like this video, comment below if you have any questions, uh, subscribe if you have not, and uh, hey, we'll talk soon.